Ricardo, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Denon and the other supporters and organizers of the symposium. Um, <clears throat> I guess you tried to set me up for something. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Um, a number of you in here have heard me uh, speak on this. Yeah, we've got to find the right talk. It's someplace. I'll just use yours, Andrew. Uh, uh, I think it's, there you go. is that it? No, 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 no. There it is. While Andrew's doing that, I'm going to, at the end, show him historically that there were some people in the Midwest of the United States that consumed more yogurt than you could ever imagine. Um, this is a topic that uh, actually, uh, here are my disclosures, they're pretty minimal, other than just being an iconoclast. Um, <clears throat> Robert Haney, who's known to many of you in this room, and I wrote this paper back in 2005, <clears throat> and because of time, um, you can go read the methodology here and see how I come up with some of the numbers. This is a difficult task to try to put a dollar figure or euro figure on what the benefits to either the U.S. or worldwide might be if we could improve uh, dairy product intake. <clears throat> Andrew set us up. It's clear that some societies are more successful at this, others are not. There's biological reasons why that may not be the case. There's also economic reasons, uh, availability, the list goes on. <clears throat> but <clears throat> where we have solid data, which is what I'm going to try to share with you, of what the potential could be, I think we need to stop and pay attention to this. Uh, it's no secret, particularly in this state of Massachusetts, that health care costs are out of control. Uh, we have a situation here, a unique one actually in Oregon where I reside that's different. But in both cases, we're trying to get a cap on uh, how we're spending our money. And I think one of the uh, challenges that the nutrition community faces is standing up and trying to inform the public, our leaders, that we have a strategy, if we could just implement it worldwide, that could lead to dramatic health care savings. I don't know what the real number is, but I can tell you the number is big, if we could do it. So my story starts here. <clears throat> what I'm going to try to do is give you just a feel for what a quality diet is. I don't think there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, with the exception of Walt's view on dairy foods. Uh, I'd like to just show examples from the literature when you describe a diet that's high quality, dairy product just sticks out in the description. It's a very consistent. And that actually, uh, Andrew's right, you have to dig to try to find specific examples, but because of the way new data is being uh, published with longitudinal studies that are fairly large databases, imperfect observational studies, there's no doubt about it, you can actually show yogurt specifically within the dairy category as being uh, tied to a health benefit or outcome. And from that, I'm going to use the process, and we're going to go through this very quickly, and we'll discuss this in much greater detail with Andres and myself in the workshop after this session. Uh, <clears throat> how do you really come up with a number that you could believe? And I, I don't think it's possible to get a firm, rock-solid number, I think it is possible to say we have an opportunity here to dramatically improve health care at a remarkably reduced price. So <clears throat> there is a member of the audience who was a partner in crime with me uh, back in 1984 when we published uh, what I think still remains the largest nutrition paper in the journal of science, which doesn't usually publish those kinds of papers where we looked at the first N. Haynes study. Uh, Victor Fulgoni took a clue from that early in his career and kept chasing these numbers through one iteration after another. And when we looked at blood pressure in America, you could do a multivariate analysis of N. Haynes and pick out the food groups that would best predict your blood pressure status. That is a good one in America. And here's the table. It's an exact reproduction of uh, table three in that article. 
And it is the original description of the DASH diet, dairy products, fruits and vegetables, non-sugar beverages. Keep a th think about this list and then the publications that have come out 30 years later. Fats and oils and essentially uh, products that are protein rich and at the bottom is the famous dessert impact that uh, was first brought out in a Cardia trial where uh, as a reviewer I said to the editor, please have these authors have the political courage to label it ice cream, uh, but they didn't. They called it frozen dairy-based dessert. Uh, and if you just went back to that <coughs> science paper, the benefit of being on a dairy-rich, fruit and vegetable-rich diet, essentially a high mineral, high protein diet, uh, <coughs> you saw a 60% reduction in the incidence or likelihood of being hypertensive in America and about a 60% improvement in weight. And by the way, this was the original description of dairy's relationship to put potentially improve weight control. And at the end of our science paper, this is what we concluded. Debbie, who's in the front of this uh, audience, may remember reading this. It's not a very exciting conclusion, but that's the way nutrition is sometimes. And it says, you know, you need to eat a balanced diet <laughs> that is appropriate for your level of activity. Uh, <clears throat> when interviewed on CBS Morning News at the time of this publication, uh, <clears throat> the anchor said to me, you know, Dr. McCarran, this is not very exciting. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had a short answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I, it is on tape. Um, <clears throat> so let's just look at some examples. If we had a, you know, more time, I had more time. There, there are those of you in the audience know that there are many examples of this. So here's the Kant study, which is actually one of the initial, you know, reasonable prospective assessments of diet quality and health risk, particularly cancer and, and cardiovascular mortality. And this is an example that if you were in a fourth quartile as opposed to the first quartile, of a healthy diet, your all-cause mortality was 35% less than if you didn't eat as good a diet, the worst one being the, the low quality. When you look at what <clears throat> those authors concluded a quality diet was, it's what I said, it's the obvious. Fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy, and lean meats. <clears throat> and surprisingly, they said it's a good idea to eat this from foods as opposed to supplements and whatnot. And they said this represents a practical recommendation. It's almost as exciting as our conclusion, you know, 20 years before in science. You, know. you can go look at, you know, what is the largest cohort that's in the medical nutritional literature, which is the NIH AARP longitudinal uh, study. And this is at a little over 10 years. The numbers are small on the screen, and I apologize for it, but what I've done is not try to distill, I've just put the tables as they appear in the literature. And if you look at it again, both in men and women, there's about a 25% reduction in all-cause mortality, the better your diet. I don't know of a drug that's out on the market that could do that. And if you look within the tables and descriptions in that paper, fruits and vegetables, low-fat dairy, whole grains, and lean meats and poultry. Now, I have to be honest, uh, the dairy is always labeled low-fat, but I'm not sure that if you start taking that data apart, that you can justify that separation. Uh, I'll be blunt and iconoclastic, apparently, for Lindsay's sake, <laughs> and say, those are political words, uh, they're not scientific words. So here's another way of looking at what, what it. What if you have a lousy dietary pattern? Um, <clears throat> work in The Lancet in 2005, and again, many of you may be familiar with this, and an interesting way of looking at it in that they took people who had little fast food or had more fast food and how they changed their intake of fast food and what happened to their essentially their insulin regulation or glucose metabolism. 
And if over the period of observation you stayed with little fast food and you didn't change, your change in your uh, insulin regulation and glucose metabolism didn't change. If you ate a lot of fast food at the beginning and you ate even more at the end, you didn't look quite as good at the end. Um, and the same thing applied for weight gain over the period of observation uh, in this study. And it's a 15-year period. Um, and it's a, you know interesting way of looking at it. If you then look at what they said increased or decreased if you ate fast foods, you know, it's not going to be surprising. If you ate fast foods and you decided to eat more fast foods, your fruits and vegetables went down, your whole grains went down, your fiber went down, and your dairy went down. You increased your soda, you increased your alcohol, you had more fat, and you ate more refined grains. So it's another way of sort of trying to position on a grid where dairy fits into a healthy diet and that it has metabolic or health consequences. There's a famous statement from uh, a past presidential candidate who's now a radio and TV host who said, you know, if it comes through the window of a car, don't eat it. Um, <clears throat> another way of looking at this is the longitudinal study of what predicts weight gain over the long haul. And this is work out of the School of Public Health here. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to come back to this, but the foods that predicted the weight gain were potato chips, that's bad news for a lot of people, potatoes, sugar-sweetened beverages, red meats, sweets and desserts, and 100% fruit juice. Those that were associated with keeping weight normal were actually improving. Top of the list, and you'll see the actual graph, was yogurt. And this is one of the studies that begins to specifically identify the yogurt component of the dairy diet as being impactful perhaps over and above other dairy foods. And then again, fruits, whole grains, nuts, vegetables, and milk. What about cardiovascular disease? Um, hypertension, stroke, heart attacks are routinely identified. We talked a little bit about this by the WHO as the big burden of disease and disease costs in this country. This is another way of picking apart observational data in people who do or do not have a cardiovascular event, in this case, stroke. And is there a difference in the way they consume, in this case, beverages that may identify some benefit of dairy products? So this is stroke risk. If the line doesn't cross the, the zero point, which is true, the lower two categories and almost true here, if you substitute tea, caffeinated beverages, for a sugar-sweetened or non-sugar-sweetened uh, beverage, and then with skim milk, you see a substantial difference in your risk of stroke. Um, we tend to think of sugar-sweetened beverages as worse than non-sugar-sweetened beverages, and I, don't, I think that's a debate that needs to keep going because the data looks like Anything is better than a soda, whatever is in the soda. And water is neutral, which makes sense. And tea, coffee, uh, fluid dairy products are good to substitute. So stop worrying when you have that third cup of coffee in the morning. You're just going to be more alert to live longer, apparently. So <clears throat> here's another way. Uh, you're looking at low-calorie sodas as opposed to sugar-sweetened. And here, clearly, if you had milk, had a caffeine drink, your risk of stroke goes down compared to drinking a diet soda or diet liquid beverage. And if you call through all the longitudinal studies that now are appearing at a fairly rapid rate in the literature, because this is data, in a lot of cases, that was collected initially or the studies were started maybe even back in the 19, late 1980s. So it's understandable that we're now just following, seeing 10, 15, 20-year follow-up data. Um, <clears throat> it's not much different than what the Ann Haynes data told us back in 1984. You need to have dairy foods, fruits and vegetables. We can argue which is more important. I haven't figured that one out. 
whole grains, I don't think there's any debate about it, how much whole grains, your intestine will tell you uh, if it's maybe too much. A handful of nuts or more every day. I'm intrigued by Rick Mattis's work out of Purdue that Connie knows that you can eat nuts if, if he's right until you're nuts. And <laughs> you burn more calories eating the nuts and digesting them than you can and get the nutrients uh, than the calories you consume. It almost sounds like nuts are the ultimate low fat or weight reducing food. And we need protein rich foods, there's no question about it. The evolution of societies have been based upon the ability to acquire these uh, sources of protein. And coffee, tea, water um, are good for you. I've shown you snippets, the, and some of this Andrew covered. There are relationships to obesity. Our science paper, there's a graph, I didn't show it. Debbie may remember it, that showed that if you were in a category of a higher dairy consumer in NHANES 1, there was a dramatic difference in your BMI in the United States. And that led to a lot of the work that was subsequently done by other investigators who, on the average, have forgotten where the original observation was made. Um, cardiovascular disease, the focus of our group many years ago, was to bring out the notion that there was a relationship between the electrolyte mineral content of dairy foods and a reduction in blood pressure, which certainly is one of the factors that lies at the heart of cardiovascular disease. Diabetes, <clears throat> show a couple examples because I'm not done here. Cancer, of course, uh, the ongoing discussion about how much calcium and vitamin D you really need. I think Bob Haney wrote one of the great lines in his New England Journal article or editorial last summer when he said more ink has been spilled on this issue with the exception of the sodium debate in the history of medical research. You know, how much calcium, how much vitamin D for bone health. Renal failure, it's an interesting story. I'm a nephrologist and I think we're gonna see over the next decade some transitions in our thinking about the relationship of diet quality to the evolution of some chronic d kidney diseases and that the community, my community, has probably uh, managed some of these patients in a reverse fashion that they should be managed in terms of uh, slowing the progression of the disease. And actually, <clears throat> probably the biggest opportunity that's out there is how we use improved nutrition during gestation, maternal and child health development. And I think, again, the points Andrew made about how the infant evolves has a mineral-rich, uh, <clears throat> milk-rich uh, diet initially, and then makes that transformation. Uh, the benefits, as originally brought, brought out by David Barker when he was still at Southampton about fetal programming, another issue that was, has been at various times hotly debated, seems to be very reproducible throughout uh, databases around the world that if you're born bigger, your mother's healthier, you live longer, you have less burden of chronic diseases. So a focus there in our societies of nutrition may have the ultimate long-term benefits in terms of not only healthcare costs, but productivity and contributions to society's advancement. The problem is if you look at the Ann Haynes databases, and Victor would be much better to speak to us, but in general, all this effort if you look at the decade of the mid-80s to mid-90s compared to the mid-90s to the mid-2000, we're actually losing ground in terms of the quality of the American diet. And I attribute this to the ability of various elements. It includes incident experts who appear to show up on TV and radio all the time who've turned eating into what I call a near-death experience. Um, <clears throat> we have created an atmosphere around our eating that scares people, and they think they have to do less, cut this out, cut that out. And we're spending all this money on biomedical research, and we're losing ground. If the leadership in 
this will be dangerous. This is what Dr. Allen predicted. If these people in Washington worked for a private company, they would have been fired 20 times over because we're not getting to where we need to get to. And a lot of that, I think, is our burden because we're not communicating what we need to, not just to our colleagues, but to society at large. So dairy foods are a surrogate for diet quality and health outcomes. It pops up in many of the databases with a wide range of reduction of disease risk. How tight the association is, how reproducible, we can discuss under certain scenarios, but it, it appears to be a very consistent finding. And if you improve dairy intake, you appear to have a major reduction in disease burden. Dairy, again, as Andrew pointed out right at the beginning, and we're going to talk about in a subsequent lecture, is a very dense nutrient package. It's relatively inexpensive, and particularly with yogurt, it's something that you could maintain and have available virtually worldwide, independent of things like refrigeration and uh, whatnot. And there's a way to follow this. If there's a paper hidden in the Journal of Nutrition that I still think is one of the more important simple observations, if you just follow urinary potassium intake, which is a marker of dairy, you can predict whether or not somebody's on a quality diet. So we're going to finish up by just showing that the risk of stroke goes down with dairy. You can then dig into stroke and a very unusual study looking at intimal thickening and its relationships specifically to yogurt consumption. And the references on here it just doesn't show on the, on the slide. So you'd either want to be in a moderate to high uh, intake category of yogurt to have less intimal thickening in uh, individuals, in this case I believe it was mostly women, who are at risk of stroke. Right, here, this is a structural change that you can at least associate with yogurt intake specifically. Overweight, again, this is a cardio study which uh, uh, showed that it literally a dose response between little, a little more, a moderate amount, a little more than moderate, and a high intake of dairy and a stepwise reduction in your risk of obesity. And then you dig in to the Harvard data, which I talked about earlier, and uh, this is an example where the literature unequivocally identifies of the foods that you would have in your diet to improve weight management. Milk is there, other dairy foods are there, but yogurt just sticks out above just about anything else. Incidence of uh, glucose intolerance, again, a dose response from the cardiac trial just as one example um, that data uh, we're going to continue to hear more about as that uh, longitudinal assessment is reported further. Um, so if you have more dairy, you have less glucose intolerance. You can go in and look at people who say they're lactose intolerant versus those who say they can eat and do eat lactose-containing dairy products, and you get numbers that are very similar to what we said in science back in 1984. Those people who are able, think they're able to have regular dairy foods have a 40% reduction in their risk tied to their description of whether or not they're lactose intolerant or not, which Dennis would tell you most of them are not, but they think they are and they're avoiding dairy products. <clears throat> those people, compared to those who are consuming dairy and yogurt, uh, have a substantially increased risk of both hypertension and diabetes. We talked uh, in the previous about the relationship of cancer. Here is uh, a paper several years ago showing roughly a 10% reduction in all cancers based upon calcium intake as a surrogate for dairy. And then you can go into this AJCN paper in 2008 where they actually <coughs> looked at uh, bladder cancer in culture of milk and yogurt, and could, in this case, again, it's an example where you can find data within dairy that pinpoints yogurt's impact. And it's not subtle. I mean, I don't know a drug that's been shown to have that impact on cancer risk. 
colon cancer, well accepted. Um, and here's the general effect. It's interesting. Uh, the folks in Bob Haney's category would like the fact that it seems to peg at least 1,400 milligrams of calcium a day, unless you're in Harvard School of Public Health. And if you look specifically that this International Journal of Cancer did at where yogurt impacts that, it's, you know, a fairly remarkable 35% reduction. And here's some of the birth weight data. This is increasing uh, birth weight, which is associated with long-term, healthier, more productive, intellectually engaging, and <clears throat> It's actually protein intake from dairy products. It's associated with this in this very large database that's in from HACN in 2007. And then, specifically, that was dairy protein. There's this paper from the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition last year that identified <clears throat> that probiotics, yogurt, were associated with a improved or reduced risk of gestational diabetes, which is a hallmark of a bad outcome of pregnancy. So probiotics, yogurts were improving or reducing the risk of gestational diabetes. So we know there's a variety of uh, benefits. This is a partial list. The data is pretty consistent in the medical literature. There's a lot of things, at least intestinally, that yogurt and probiotic uh, dairy products provide. They cover some pretty common problems in society, and they're fairly expensive ones. And consistent use of uh, probiotic uh, dairy foods, yogurt, would appear to impact. So if you went into the medical literature in the, or the government literature a year ago, roughly 18 months ago, and looked at the health care costs, and this is a very dicey proposition. Our country no country really knows what it's spending on certain diseases. And that's the problem of building an economic model because you can't be certain what the base cost of a disease is. But as best as you can determine from sources by searching the internet, uh, these are the costs based really on 2009, 2010 data. <clears throat> what Given the total cost and what you know the data says you can do with blood pressure, ischemia, stroke, and you can read our original paper, we use the same conservative assumptions. So these are numbers that are roughly 25% of what you could claim was the benefit. And these are the savings that if the United States just got 25% of the population to increase their dairy intake that over the, even the first year, because some of these benefits are seen immediately, particularly with issues like uh, blood pressure and diabetes. And uh, the end of the list, cancers, osteoporosis, they're big numbers. This adds up to a big number. And it's almost so big, you look at it and you say, this is in the fairy tale category. But I don't think it is. Uh, this country, and it was highlighted in a Kaiser, uh, study from the Kaiser Family Foundation reported yesterday, we're well into the trillions of health care costs in this country. This is not a ridiculous figure for a year when you consider that. And if you reasonably projected, given the fact that some of these effects take years to kick in, you could make a reasonable estimate that in the United States in five years, we would save the amount of money that the Congress is trying to find in our budget. I just think we need to put our congressmen on a yogurt diet. It would probably be better. <laughs> so it's essential, yogurts. Why the nutritional profile, the unique probiotic characteristics that go back thousands of years, and it then provides a way for the lactose intolerant to consume. It's available, it's portable, wide range of flavors. It fits in with the fruit and whole grain type issues that you can eat it with. Here, Andrew, is the example of overconsumption. I show this with some trepidation, but it's an exact quote from JAMA from 
two years ago about Dr. Kellogg, who founded a cereal company in Battle Creek. And I'll let you read what Dr. Kellogg used to do to his patients <laughs> in Battle Creek. Um, it sort of raises the question of maybe it doesn't matter how you ingest it. <laughs> it's all Greek to me. So. But the study of medicine is still the study of individual patients. This woman who was visited by Mr. Obama should have been the poster child for nutrition and health in America, although her diet doesn't fit with what the chef of the White House is promoting in the United States. But she lived pretty long, and she did really well, eating fried chicken, crispy bacon, and yes, ice cream. Thank you. Questions for Dr. McCarran. The microphone is here. Can you introduce yourself and Hi, I'm Barbara Rolls from Penn State. Um, there are a lot of excellent randomized clinical trials such as DASH, and they look at dairy. Do you think there's a possibility to go back and separate out yogurt, different types of dairy products, and uh, tease out benefits? Yeah, I, I would have to believe that Bill Vollmer at the Kaiser Center for Health Research in my hometown has that data. And whether the component of yogurt had some type of a bigger impact, the problem there is it's a very small sample and it's a very short duration, but it's a clue and it could be helpful. But I, I think maybe we ought to try to explore what um, RCT data are out there that could have this kind of secondary analysis applied. Andrew? So my question is kind of related. Um, you've made some, some very strong claims, David. And I, I, he I, set me up. I mean, of course. What am I going to do? But I, I, I also set you up by saying that these analyses are, are very complicated. And I don't believe I heard you use the word confounding in your talk. So I think in fairness, I need to press you, especially with a lot of young people in the audience, I need to press you to address, which I'm, I'm sure you have done at great length, but address for us the issue of how you deal with um, potential residual confounding in such associations. So, uh, you know, that's, it's the problem that nutrition research can almost never solve because um, foods are what we eat, not nutrients. Those foods are made up of a variety of different nutrients and the different foods likewise, and you get into a statistical canubrium that is almost impossible to tease apart. That said, and I don't mean to set Andres up, but that's what we're gonna talk about in the workshop is, okay, you have these observations. I guess I'm reminded of somebody uh, who uh, was a faculty colleague at Oregon back around the time the science, our first science paper came out. And we were constantly hounded with what is it that makes the blood pressure go down? And a lot of work had, was done, has done, been done, it's still being done to try to figure that out. But this individual who was not a nutritionist but eventually became the president of the American Society of Nephrology, so he was not totally without a cerebral cortex, said, what's it matter? if?" These foods help you, then let's make sure we emphasize those foods. But your point is the problem that we're always going to have, and um, we have to be careful. What I know, I feel, is we're not improving the quality of the diet worldwide. It's going the wrong direction. And if we could be better at that, we would be extending life on fewer meds, fewer hospitalizations, and costs would go down. It probably boils down to the components that appear to keep coming out of these surveys, and statistically to come up with a number, it's impossible. 
<clears throat> Next question, please. Yeah, hi, Dan Marenstein from Georgetown University. And just to get to that, uh, it's a problem we have, but we can address that. We can do randomized controlled trials. I mean, I feel like I could have replaced every slide you had with poverty or socioeconomic status, and I would have almost had the same exact outcome. But really my question is, with, with randomized controlled trials, to my, much of my surprise, the, the, the best randomized controlled trials we have, although they're short term, show the Atkins diet is the best for lipids, for blood pressure, for weight loss. And, and where does that on, on the, the low fat, low, um, the dairy product? You're also ra yeah, uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, you can put, not people like me, but other people who have been engaged in these types of debates who will argue with you that maybe in the area of nutrition, randomized controlled trials aren't the best, uh, partly because of the duration and whatnot. But there's no question that to the limited extent that some of these diet patterns have been tested in a randomized controlled trial, you are better off with what has generally been considered uh, the Atkins type protocol. That doesn't mean it's the optimal diet. It just means compared to some other potentially bad diet, it looks better, so. Very good. Uh, people are standing in the back. There's still seats over here. If you want to come up, question? Well Margobark or Sheffield. I was very interested in your comment that urinary potassium was a good biomarker of dairy intake and perhaps to corroborate some of the data we're coming from these observational studies that high da dairy is beneficial, we should be supporting those data with measures of urinary potassium. Yeah, we uh, evolved to excrete two nutrients every day, almost in totality, and they're sodium and potassium. And they are two of the nutrients that, on the bad and the good, we've debated ad nauseum. Uh, hopefully some clarity is soon to arrive on the sodium issue. The study I talked about was done by Sandy Logan and Andrew Mel Melton at Toronto in the uh, Mount Sinai research group there, and they had good data on what people were eating and they showed very nice correlations between improving diet quality and a simple marker as urinary potassium. That's something a nutritionist or a physician could use and it's inexpensive and to say you're making progress or you're not making progress. Thank you. Before we close I have a question as uh, chairman. Uh, how about your comparisons between high and low fat and the emerging data that high fat is potentially even better than low fat yogurt? I think you asked me that question because you thought I'd be dumb enough to answer it. Uh, <laughs> but um, listen, dietary fat is a political issue as much as it is a scientific issue. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, We've had particularly regulatory agencies and advocacy groups come down very strongly on the side of certain aspects of the human diet. Those positions are thought to be non-conflicted, but I would argue that the position of a governmental agency or an advocacy group such as American Heart or whatnot is every bit as conflicted as a corporate position is because they've put a stake in the ground and they've said, it's got to be low fat, it's got to be low sodium. And when the data begins to shift on you, what do you do? You go eat yogurt. Well, I'd like to make a point, though, relative to WHO has already has taken note, and in fact, stearic acid is a saturated fat, but is considered neutral from the standpoint of cardiovascular right. risk. So again, and thank everybody, and I know we've got to move on. Okay, very good. So, thank you.